This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we discuss psychological and emotional issues and what you can do about them, whether that's learning self acceptance, taking action, or seeking therapy or treatment. Eight years ago, I extended the walls of my practice to reach those of you who might already be knowledgeable about mental health treatment, but also to those of you who might say you'd never darken the door of a therapist. And yet, you are here. I'll answer your questions while I invite you to take a few minutes for your own self-work. Cognitive behavioral therapy is an approach where you're looking at your thinking, you're challenging your thinking, you're identifying what behaviors you want to increase in your life, and you're setting up reinforcement patterns and self-monitoring, like tracking how you're doing. It tends to be very structured work. It's kind of get it done, get it done therapy, you know? Welcome to this week's edition of Self Work. Our guest today is Dr. Diana Hill, and frankly, I came upon her work on Instagram, and I was very intrigued by the way she talked about what she did. Just really down to earth, I really liked her. She is an ACT therapist, meaning she practices what's called acceptance and commitment therapy. And in this interview, she really explains it well. ACT talks a lot about psychological flexibility, and there are six cornerstones, which you'll hear her again talk about. I just thought I'd outline them for you. It's acceptance, cognitive diffusion, which is a way of handling your thoughts and maybe keeping them in perspective, which is actually the third cornerstone, perspective, being present, mindfulness, and committed action. Maybe that's really what I love about it, because here at Self Work, we're all about what you can do about it, right? Diana has an ACT daily journal that's published by the same publisher I have, New Harbinger. Her website is drdianahill.com, and she has a podcast called Wise Effort. But before we get to our interview with Dr. Hill, here's a message from AG1. I just finished drinking mine this morning and an offer for you. It's important to me that the supplements I take are of the highest quality, and that's why, for years, I've been drinking AG1. Unlike many supplement brands, AG1 conducts relentless testing to set the standard for purity and potency. Quality for AG1 isn't just a buzzword, it's a commitment. And at each step of the process, AG1 goes above and beyond industry standards. I know I can trust what's in every scoop of AG1 because they obsess over product quality the standards of their manufacturing, and sustainable practices. Taking care of your health shouldn't be complicated, and AG1 simplifies this by replacing all those multiple health supplements, like your multivitamins, digestive aids, immune support, and more in just one simple scoop. AG1's ingredients are heavily researched for their quality, and I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. I've partnered with AG1 for so long because they make such a high-quality product that I drink every day. So if you want to replace your multivitamin and more, start with AG1. Try it and get a free one-year supply, a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription at drinkag1.com slash self-work. Again, that's drinkag1.com slash self-work. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. Now, let's get to my interview with Dr. Diana Hill. I sought you out on Instagram because I was I was just intrigued by what you were posting and I I have true confessions here. I've been a therapist for 30 years, but I've never taken any training in ACT. Yeah. I know a whole lot about it. I've read some articles about it, that, but that's acceptance and commitment therapy. And I saw that you were and are an expert in that. And so I thought, well, who better to have on self-work to discuss ACT than Diana? So I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Where are you? Where I'm looking at this gorgeous room behind you. Where are you? I'm in my therapy space in Santa Barbara, California, and we're kind of nestled. I have a home office and then I have an office downtown, but this is my home office kind of nestled up in the 
canyon here with lots of oak trees and also well it's beautiful yeah. it's beautiful yeah. <laughs> yeah. so tell us a little bit about you how did you get interested in in psychology and in being a therapist and all of the above oh gosh you know there's the true story to that and then there's the cover story that you tell well, in your application which one do you want to tell <laughs> <laughs> so we all know the cover story that i tell in my applications but the, the true story was i struggled uh with anorexia and bulimia as a teenager and i uh, you know, we had a lot of mental health problems. And uh, as I found my way through that process, it really became clear to me that I wanted to give back, right? As, mm-hmm. as many of us do. And was really interested early on in mindfulness and acceptance-based approaches. Mm-hmm. I went um, to graduate school at CU Boulder and I studied appetite awareness training and worked with um, Deborah Safer at Stanford to study DBT. And at the time, that dialectical behavior therapy was one of the first sure. approaches that was bringing um, these concepts in. But then I found ACT and I, I really fell in love with this approach in particular because it's a little bit less structured. I really liked ACT because of its incorporation of values and it's a little bit more flexible, a little more fluid, and it's used for really a lot of different things, everything from it's been used for anxiety disorders, um, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. eating disorders, but also is used for performance coaching. Athletes are using it. They're using it with Olympic, Olympic athletes uh, um, in work settings and even in the, at the organizational level. And it's really designed to help you develop something called psychological flexibility. It has a lot right. of different ways in which it does that. But um, I loved that concept that maybe we're not supposed to necessarily get rid of bad feelings, but rather oh, become yeah. more flexible when the, the hard stuff shows up in life and it will show up to it for us over and over again, right? Sure. It never goes away. My, my listeners know that I have panic disorder. I got it, gosh, back in my 20s. And um, I remember going to the, I'd gone to several therapists to help me get rid of the panic attacks. I hated them, you know. Yeah. I sat down in this one man's office and he ended up being my therapist for two or three years. And and I said, okay, I, I want to get rid of these panic attacks. And he said, I'm not going to help you do that. And I said, why not? And he said, because they're just as, just as important a part of you as the part of you that you don't mind other people knowing or that you are comfortable with. And I just looked at him and I said, I, I remember feeling angry. And then I, I thought, you know, nothing else has worked. Maybe this is where I need to go. And that's exactly what I thought about when you just said that. Yeah. Well, that is right there. The um, kernel cornerstone of ACT is that mm-hmm. we, um, we embrace it all. And the, the, the irony is that probably when you do that, your panic <laughs> attacks will lessen <laughs> when yeah. you're not battling so much, right? Because oftentimes it's our battle with our inner experiences that cause, whether it's our thoughts that we don't want to have. If you have something like OCD, right? You're battling your thoughts. I wish these would go away and they just come back stronger. There's good evidence around that same with our feelings and when we can open ourselves up to experience our full life experience but also ourselves beyond that as you said like there's so much more to to who you are beyond having panic disorder right Mm -hmm. and that that sense of expansive self is also something that we explore in one of the processes of act as well so okay so let's talk a little bit about act act acceptance and commitment therapy so How is it different and how is it similar to like CBT or some of the uh, or just um, what might be called interpersonal therapy where, you know, the, the, the focus is really on the relationship or, you know, how can you compare and contrast it? Yeah, great question. Well, I would say ACT considers itself a cognitive behavioral approach. Okay. Uh, it's built on the back of CBT in some ways. So it has a lot of the behavioral aspects to it. You may even think that you're doing some similar things. It's very different in its approach to thoughts. Cognitive behavioral therapy is an approach where you're looking at your thinking, you're challenging your thinking, you're identifying what behaviors you want to increase in your life, and you're setting up reinforcement patterns and moderate self-monitoring, like tracking how you're doing. It tends to be very structured. Mm-hmm. It doesn't tend to do a lot of work on like your history and your past and, right. you know, that kind of depth work. It's kind oriented. of get it done, get it done therapy. You get know? her done, get her get done. done. And it, and it's helpful. And a lot of people do well with it. I mean, they consider it the gold standard for a lot of treatments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes it's not, not helpful for some people. Uh, what act, how act differs is that there's a, there's a very different approach to thoughts. 
where not every thought needs to be challenged or even replaced or, um, you know, is wrong. I, I have a, a, a client who um, is going through a divorce and she was telling me about that excruciating, if you've been through a door, divorce and you have kids, oh, yeah. that excruciating time when you're at a soccer game and there your kids are and you're on the sidelines and there's your ex <laughs> and you're, mm-hmm. you're trying to watch your kid play soccer and you can just feel their presence, right? And she and she was talking about, oh, my gosh, there I am on the sidelines of the soccer game. And all I can think about is what a narcissist he is, how much I hate him. Uh, you know, all these like it was sucking my energy mm-hmm. from being able to be there with my kids. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if I would challenge that thought. I, I know a little <laughs> bit about her ex and she's pretty accurate. <laughs> It's a real doozy of a guy. So, you know, I wouldn't challenge it. Well, let's look at this. Is he really a narcissist? Is that yeah. accurate? Is this not accurate? Is that, is that a, you know, are you catastrophizing there? Are you over, not really. Yeah. But, but what I, what I worked with her to do is, okay, what are your values here? What do you, what do you, why are you at the soccer game? Is it to hate your ex or is it for something else? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. my values are I want I want to connect with the other parents that are there. I want to I want my son to feel my presence and that I'm I'm like all in watching him. Right. So we identified what her values are. That's going to be her compass. That's where pointing your energy. Okay. okay. And then with the thoughts, we can start to notice that though that you're having a thought, and you can notice it come on by narcissist thought, but mm-hmm. you can just let it move across the field like all the other very things. Buddhist, that are very about. Buddhist. Let it float it's by. Very Buddhist. It's very Buddhist. And that was my uh, interest in it, actually, because my um, I grew up um, with a lot of Buddhist influences. I uh, traveled to Plum Village when I was 19 and um, got to uh, practice with Thich Nhat Hanh. So it, that's what really resonated with me. But, it, but it's, a different, it's just slightly different with those thoughts. So we're identifying our values. We're allowing thoughts to come and go, not getting hooked by them in an act. We call that cognitive diffusion. It's different than interpersonal therapy because there is a little bit more structure to it. You are working with the client to, to kind of see specifically how and, 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 and where they are stuck and why they are stuck. Is it the thought that's stuck, sticking her? Something else could be um, overwhelming her. It could be that she's at the, it's not the thought. But she's at the game and she's overwhelmed by panic attacks. She's overwhelmed by this or overwhelmed by anger, like a strong emotion inside of her body. Right. And so there's a whole series of processes and practices that you work with strong emotions, um, things that are really related to acceptance mostly. So I was was intrigued. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was intrigued by the idea. So it's not always values based. No, there's, there's six processes to it. Okay. So it is always values based. Values is one of them. We're always a- aiming for our values, but there's sure. six processes that help you be able to keep your compass pointing in that direction. Oh, okay. and then when you get off track, to get back on. So there are processes that are like, there's acceptance that's related to your feelings, diffusion, which is how to step back from your thoughts. There's perspective taking, like how do you get behind someone else's eyes? What do you think it's like to be your husband there? <laughs> <laughs> your ex, you know, mm-hmm. or or another parent that's also, you know, struggling, and uh, you the do woman that, that had the affair with him, exactly. <laughs> <also> there, <laughs> he's probably there too. How do you think she feels? <laughs> Which one of you feels worse? Uh, and then, and then there's um, practices related to being present. That's another process. I'm sorry, what? Being present. Being present. You know, mindfulness. Being present. And, mindfulness. And really, that's what yeah. you said. Yeah, so it it has that that um, you know mindfulness acceptance quality to it that we see in DBT and other types of therapies, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then practices related to committed action, which are doing it, the getting it done part of CBT. But it's yep. not all the getting it done, right? That's just one part of it, mm-hmm. and that's where you kind of see that flavor of of CBT. But it's it's also so much more than that, and just getting it done. Hmm. One, two, three, four. Yeah, there's six. There's six. <laughs> um, that's, that's really, uh, th- what I like about it, 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 one, it sounds very approachable. It sounds approachable from a learning perspective for a therapist. It sounds approachable from a learning perspective for a patient. Yeah. How often do you talk to your patients about the fact that, Hey, I'm an ACT therapist. This is kind of what I believe is going to be helpful to you. I'm pretty transparent, just like your therapist yeah. was to you. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. your therapist said, I'm not that kind of therapist. I, I'm not here to get rid of your panic attacks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm pretty transparent that um, this is how I approach 
work working with a client and that's going to look different for every single client. Mm-hmm. I'm not pulling out a protocol and going through chapter one, chapter two, chapter three with right. these with folks. I'm, I'm attending right. to what's happening in the room. I'm attending to our relationship. I'm seeing how even these processes show up in our own way in our relationship in the room. Because, and even for me as a therapist, therapists avoid mm-hmm. difficult feelings. They will ask questions that they probably should be asking of their clients because it's uncomfortable for them, right. right? We've all experienced that. So even as a therapist, I need to be psychologically flexible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm modeling that psychological flexibility to my clients. I'm talking about psychological flexibility. I may not use terminology like cognitive diffusion with every client, yeah, probably. but I'll use, I'll use uh, terminology. All my clients will know like, okay, let, hold on. Is, are you all caught up in your thoughts? Are you feeling like your thoughts are right up in your face and you can't see clearly? Hold up your hands in front of your face. This is what it's like. If you were to move your hands like 10 feet or two feet in front of you, sure. you'll see a little better. Well, yeah. that, 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 these are your, this is your narcissistic husband thoughts. Mm-hmm, let's get mm-hmm. them like, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's get some perspective on them. Get some perspective, a little space. And then you get to choose. Do I want to look at that thought? Cause you actually may, you may want to look at it from time to time. Mm-hmm. Even our most painful thoughts or, um, difficult thoughts, we, we want to check out. Mm-hmm. They might sometimes may be helpful. Like the thought, um, you know, am I doing a good job at this? It, that's always clouding your vision. Am I doing a good job? Then that's all you're thinking about. You're kind of oh, exactly. micromanaging your behavior. Oh, exactly. But every once in a while, you need to check it out. Am I doing a good job? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do I need a, do I need a little feedback here? Or correct myself, do a better job. Sure. That's fine. It's just getting that space and that flexibility. So we're working on flexibility in all these different areas, flexibility mm-hmm. with our feelings, flexibility with our thoughts, flexibility with our sense of self, flexibility with our behavior, and flexibility with our attention. Well, the analogy I've used sometimes is it's because I'm sort of a, a very, I try to use some practical analogies is when you're standing up in front of a mirror, you, your vision is blurry. You know, you can't see what's in front of you. You see something of an image, but you don't really, when you get back, from it, you see it much more clearly. And that's exactly what you're saying, you okay. know, is that if you get these thoughts um, more away from you or these, you know, that then you can uh, look at them a little more objectively, a little more reasonably, and then say, wait a minute, what do I want to focus on? So, yeah, that's great. So let's take a break and we'll be back in just a moment. All couples go through times when they feel what I call out of sync. You're seeming to be in one space and your partner is in another. It's normal. But how do you get back in sync? The newest sponsor of self-work, Paired, has an idea. It's an app for couples who want to strengthen their relationship, and it's founded on the simple belief that real love takes practice and a little bit of time. This is how it works. You and your partner both download the app. Then you pair together, and the app will take it from there. A few minutes a day that is focused on the two of you can make a world of difference. Whether you're just a few dates in or have been together a long time, Find the time to connect with your partner and nourish your relationship. With the Paired app, it's easy and fun, and it only takes five minutes a day. Head to Paired.com slash SelfWork to get a seven-day free trial and 25% off if you sign up for a subscription. Just head to Paired, P-A-I-R-E-D dot com slash SelfWork to sign up today. So what are their disorders or their are there particular problems that people might be having? Let's say they're going through a divorce. So would a, a therapy like that, or like they, they are couples, couples therapy, would do mm-hmm. couples come in for this kind of work? Absolutely. There's been act uh, a lot of work with ACT for couples. And actually there's some research around ACT in families and ACT in couples when uh, one member is uh, more psychologically flexible, there's less spillover effects onto the kids in terms of stress. Hmm. There's also less uh, marital discord, better communication, greater closeness, right? So, Mm -hmm. and we think about it. If we think about a couple, you know, you think about you're in a, you're in a fight with your partner in the kitchen. For some reason, always happens in the kitchen in our house. Always, always. (laughs) Always in the kitchen. In the bathroom. In the bath. Yeah. Those are the two. (laughs) You've got toothbrush (laughs) in your mouth. Uh, But you're in a fight with your partner in the kitchen. And you need to have all these skills on board, right? You need to remember that you love this person. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like you hate them, but you love them. And, and how do you want to be? So that would be your values. How do you want to be? Like, what would it mean if someone actually videotaped you right now? Would you be horrified about what you mm-hmm. saw? Or would you feel gotcha. pretty good about how you're showing up, right? So that's the values. 
You also want to practice some perspective taking, get behind their eyes from time to time. What's it like to be them? Hey, what was their day like before they got to this point? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there, that would be another act process, getting present, pushing your feet into the ground, feeling yourself here and now, not the year from now that you're projecting into or last week that you're still stuck on. Mm -hmm. That's another process. So you can see how if you're engaging with these processes, that's going to help that interaction with your partner go a lot better. And if you have those skills on board. Yeah. You know, maybe it would be helpful, Diana, for you to, of course, anonymously talk about someone who's been in your practice who has, and who had, well, you use this with everyone, I, I take it, but that it's been particularly helpful with them. Can you think of a particular uh, client or? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can think of so many. I'm thinking of one just because I just saw them today. So they're on okay. my mind, but okay. I'm a cancer survivor. Mm. And um, this was a, a client who, Again, I'll change identifying information, but who we went through um, s soon after we started working together, um, got a cancer diagnosis. And I went through the whole, the whole treatment with them. But actually what was, that was excruciating, but where ACT was particularly helpful was when they were done with treatment, mm -hmm. they were so worried about it coming back. Yes. And that constantly on my mind, thinking about the cancer, I feel like I can't I can't enjoy my life. I can't plan my future. Um, wanting to go do more and more tests that weren't called for because I just wanted to keep checking. I mean, it's not that pain of feeling like life is on hold and sure. you can't live it, right? Sure. And this is where it was so helpful. I remember one day um, him coming in and, and saying, like, I had this moment where um, I was out surfing and I felt for a minute connected to being alive. And I think I got what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. I got the experience of this is it right here, right now. Mm -hmm. And what was happening for him in that moment was he was connecting to something bigger, which is a self process, mm -hmm. but he was also able to let go of all of the holding on the gripping, the pushing away. I don't want it and be with here. It is. I can, I can be in the paradox of both. I mean, paradoxes are unresolvable in some ways so you have to embrace both sides the both and thinking of it like i can both have a cancer diagnosis and be in recovery from cancer and i can fully live my life right they can both exist so that was an example of just where i've seen tremendous change and things haven't changed but internally a lot has changed and that's where act is particularly beneficial for is that when when you can't change things in life and you're stuck with circumstances that maybe you don't like how you can do the inner work to be able to be psychologically flexible enough to live with what is and maybe live an even fuller life with what is. That takes, it takes a different way of being with things than sure trying is. to just fix them or solve them or get rid of them, which is what most of us are taught to do. And we're pretty good at most, most you know, if you have a flat tire, you fix it. But some things aren't going to get fixed. A result. So was it helpful, this particular technique? Was it helpful for you with your eating disorder? Well, I didn't use it with my eating disorder because I was much I was much younger, but I would say well, I mean you didn't use it, but I wonder if I worked at a treatment center. So I was a clinical director of a um intensive outpatient program for eating disorders prior to going into private practice. Okay. And I would develop the groups. I developed all designed all the groups around ACT and the individual work. And man, it was very helpful. Right. Because if you think about, um, especially for something like anorexia, where there's so much rigidity, right? Mm -hmm. we, 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 what we need is flexibility. And we also need something with anorexia. It's, it's, um, it's a disorder that's considered egocentonic, which means you kind of like your disorder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Love it. I want <laughs> to love it around for a while. It's, it's been, yeah, it's, it kind of, it kind of gives you a lot of good things. Right. So, so if you imagine like you're, you're holding on tight to this eating disorder, right? Mm -hmm. And as long as you're holding on tight to this eating disorder, you can't pick up something else. Mm -hmm. And maybe that something else that you want to pick up is, is worth picking up in your life. Sure. Right. So, so with ACT, we're, we're working on like, okay, well, well, gosh, would you be willing to let it go for a minute so you could try, try picking this other thing up? Like a connecting relationship or going out to dinner with your, with your family or um, having a little bit more energy in the morning so that you can take your dog for a walk and you know, the things that, what do you want your life to be about? Yeah. And uh, so it's very helpful with that kind of rigidity as well. And, and, and 
and similar to DBT in, in designing a life that's worth living. That's really fascinating. I, I, I like this idea of so much of the direction being about, you know, the, about creation of the, of the life you want. And, and then the idea that, um, you, you know, you don't want to necessarily get rid of thoughts. They're just, you want to notice them and then balance them with other things. And, um, be they your value system or be they, um, being in the present. You know, I think we all can identify with those moments in our lives where it's, if you really pay attention to them, even if just for a few seconds, they can bring you such a sense of connection, whether it be, I mean, it could be anything, it could literally be anything. Right. Um, so uh, now is there, you, you, well, I want to talk a little bit about your own, your own uh, products or whatever we want to call it, your, your ways <laughs> of your means of communication. You have a podcast called Wise Effort. Yeah. So you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Wise Effort is sort of my, um, my, my outgrowth of act, um, something that's more personal in mine, you know, oh, okay. that, um, well, not mine, it, that the word wise effort comes from the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. So it's mm -hmm. not a term that I came up with, but the concept of it has to do with putting your energy, your life force into places that matter to you mm -hmm. and then enjoying the good that is here right now, using that as a renewable resource, right? So I think we have a bit of an outdated idea around our energy that it's like this limited supply and then we need to go get like a massage when we're like completely depleted and build it back up again and then go mm -hmm. in and refuel. deplete ourselves to the bottom mm -hmm. yeah refuel a lot of us are doing that that kind of works but uh i have found that actually some of the things that are most energizing to me are also some of the things that are incredibly challenging to me my work but my, my most Sometimes, you know, a client that's going through cancer treatment can be my, the client that actually revitalizes my day the most. And I'm doing the hardest work in that session. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So what's that about? Right. That when we put our energy into places that matter to us, it feeds us back when we're engaging with our values in this way. Mm -hmm. And we also can get rejuvenated. By, it's just you were talking about sometimes it's standing in the line at the grocery store and watching the, the dad with like the kid behind you and they're like playing peekaboo in line and it's like oh my gosh this right now is it's feeding me i'm not yeah. on my phone i'm actually you know engaging with this yes this exactly. life that's always always giving to us always but we have to wake up to see it right so wise effort is about that and i um i, I talk about it in lots of different ways i interview people I do real plays where I demonstrate therapy, which is like, oh, nice. that's been energizing for me. To, yeah, but it's so. super hard. Um, <laughs> and then I've actually had some therapists demonstrate on me on the show. I had um, Richard Schwartz from Internal Family Systems come on. That was scary because he's like master therapist doing it on me. And then I have skill building episodes where I'm like, those are the get, you know, get down to it. Six steps to boost your creativity kind of episodes. And those are fun too. We kind of need all of it, right? Um mm -hmm. But uh, I'm excited about that. I'm working on a book on that right now. But I have two other books. I have a book on self-compassion. And I have a book on called, called the Self-Compassion Daily Journal. And I have a book called the Act Daily Journal. Mm -hmm. And those are sort of stepwise moving through how to build your self-compassion or how to build act in your life. And those are already out and available. So if you could say what being a therapist has meant in your life so far, what would you say? makes me tear up <laughs> i just mm -hmm. it's um i feel very very grateful to have had this opportunity to sit in spaces with people that share what they share with me some you know that they haven't shared with anyone sometimes you know how many times i've heard i haven't told anyone this but mm -hmm. and the the trust that people give me to to hold that and then the the beauty of vulnerability and the beauty of just being present with humans you know everything else is dropped like i don't care what job they have what wh right. whoever they are outside of here it's just it's just a human being with another human being for 50 minutes and um <laughs> it's the best gift in the world to me so i'm very grateful i can see that in your eyes yeah mm -hmm. you know i had someone um yeah, i was laughing when you said that for 50 minutes it's like 
there's a scene from Ted Lasso where he's, did you ever watch Ted Lasso? And he's trying to figure out this therapist that he's hired to, you know, come treat the team. And one, of, she's tr- trying to get him to open up a little bit about himself and, and trust her. And he says something like, so I'm supposed to trust you. So you charge me for an hour, right? And she goes, <laughs> yes. He goes, but you only see me 50 minutes, right? <laughs> she goes, yes. He said, well, how am I supposed to, you know, then, you know, uh, you know, whatever, use, use your word of choice there. <laughs> how am I supposed yeah. to trust you? You know, this is a bunch of bullshit. And then he walks out of the room. Yeah. Uh, so when you said that 50 minutes part, I thought, you know, that that's probably a bit of a conundrum for some of our clients. Yeah, but you know what? I would say if we really charge them, how much we're thinking about them would be a lot more. Well, so am right. I going to charge you for 2 a.m. when I wake up in the middle of the night worried about you that you're drinking again? Yeah. I'm not charging you for that. Right. And yeah. so, you know, this this thought that that these people come into our lives, and they don't impact us. They absolutely impact us. Now, sure. we have capacity to hold it because we've trained in that. Like, mm-hmm. I don't take everybody's problems and like, you know, mm-hmm. but they still impact me. And of I still think about do. them. And I still think about them. You know, I, one of my clients, uh, her mother's favorite flower was a calla lily. And there's these calla lilies that bloom in April every year on my lane. And her mother died when she was two years old. Oh wow! And I worked with her as a, a teenager, and she would t- she t- would talk about her mother. I haven't seen this woman. This woman's probably like twenty five now. But every time those calla lilies, calla come, lilies come out, about that client, I'm like, and sure. I say a little, you know, acknowledgement. Oh, that's just a beautiful story. That's really beautiful. Um, so one last question, and just is very generic. Is there something that you would want to say to people who are considering coming into therapy and what you know it can be and what it has been perhaps for you, uh, what you've, what some of your own clients have told you, how it has changed them? What, what would you say? Um, I would say trust your instinct around whether your therapist feels like the right fit for you. Uh, great answer. So start there. Don't feel like you're stuck with this person. <laughs> I've mm. been in a lot of therapy situations where I felt mm. like I was stuck with them. And then I kept on going for them, not, for, you know, not really for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People pleaser by nature. But, but to trust that and, 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 and give yourself some time, you know, try it a few sessions. Don't just end after one session. Um, but also, usually clients, I, I find, will give about 80% if we're lucky and leave and, and hold back 20%. Mm-hmm. Like it's that 20% that they don't say. Mm-hmm. And the clients that tell me that extra 20%, they really get their money's worth. Wow. So, so, yeah. so, yeah. so put that 20% in there because I guarantee you that therapist has heard that 20% before. Mm-hmm. That would mm-hmm. be my, my recommendation. Yeah. Especially the longer you're in the business, the, the yeah, less we've heard it all. <laughs> It has been delightful to talk with you. Thank you so much, Diana. And um, I I hope that you have enjoyed it as much as I have. I've had a blast. You're a terrific interviewer. You're so much fun and so relaxed. And gosh, sometimes I get on these things and it's like, I feel like I'm in a straight jacket. So I feel like I, <laughs> I, I, could, match, I could match your energy of just you're open and fun to be with. So sure. thank you. Well, good. you're so welcome. Uh-huh. I hope you could hear just how down to earth Dr. Hill is or Diana is. She was really, really fun to talk to, very easy to talk to. Next week is our 400th episode of Self Work. I cannot believe it, but yet I can't believe it. What I'm going to do for next week is feature a very moving interview I did with a woman who lost her husband to suicide and who reached out to me when she heard about perfectly hidden depression saying, I think this is my husband. I am sad to say, but also honored to say, that she's not the only person that's reached out to me in the last six or seven years. And sadly, she's probably not going to be the only one. So next week will be a very moving interview with Penny Gray. Thank you, as always, for being here. Please feel free to email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com and let me know what you'd like to hear what questions you have or comments you might want to make. 
And of course, you can subscribe at drmargaretrutherford.com. That is the easiest way to keep in touch with me. You'll get one newsletter on Monday morning each week where I talk about what I've been writing about and what these episodes are about for the week. Love to have you there. Again, my gratitude to you and for you. Please take very good care of yourself, your loved ones, and your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.